Welcome back to LER 660 Strategic Planning. I was very pleased with your postings in week one, and I hope that you noticed, for example, in the various strategic planning models that you went and found and posted in our discussion thread, the similarities between all of them. We're uh, completely online for the next two weeks, working through Bryson and some additional readings as well. And if you need help or don't understand something or, you know, find the instructions confusing, just email me or call me and I will fix it and take care of it. Our assignments in week two are to watch these two presentations that I've created for you. Read chapters four through six in Bryson and resource B at the back of the Bryson book. In doc sharing in week two, you're going to find a series of articles. You need to choose an article that hopefully that hasn't already been read and posted by somebody else, and then give us your feedback, a couple of paragraphs, two to three, on what was important in that article and how you might use it, and uh, finish up your discussion threads as well. Within uh, Bryson's model, there's a section called mandates. Now, most employees, whether we're talking about nonprofit or uh, government entities, don't know what's mandated or who mandated it to them. So it's very hard, of course, for us at any level of the organization to accomplish what we don't know and understand, and confusion causes all of us at any level of hierarchy to be inactive or to waste resources and get frustrated because we can't get to where we want to be. We don't know where that is. If we work in the healthcare or educational sectors, for example, mandates are not unusual and they can change given the political winds of Washington or Lansing. So as Bryson discusses in Chapter 4, if mandates apply, we need to identify them, decipher the legalese within them, and clarify both what is and what isn't allowed under the mandates. If we're working in the private sector, then mandates are really dictated by the marketplace, whether we're involved in a consumer or a business-to-business environment. That's why Apple, for example, has new iPhones and iPads every year, if not sooner. They've determined that their customers demand that level of product development and that there is a market to make those purchases that often. Unlike, say, Whirlpool, when we don't buy major appliances more than several years apart. But depending on the specific products, you can buy a stove or a dishwasher for actually less than a new iPad costs. All organizations must be led by a guiding vision. That's uh, Warren Bennis from 2003, which makes clear to all stakeholders what the purpose for existence of the organization is in the first place. The mission statement is the measurement by which all decisions by the board and the executives, for that matter staff as well, are made regarding what is important. For the purposes of this discussion, a vision statement would be a document describing where the organization wants to be, while a value statement describes how the organization will achieve the desired outcomes. As such, a vision statement may come out of a strategic planning initiative, and a value statement stems from the expectations of the board and staff behavior, which falls under governance. A mission statement, in addition to providing the core definition of what the organization is internally, should also provide clarification to all stakeholders, not just shareholders or stockholders, but stakeholders. Simplicity provides a branding opportunity that all the stakeholders may grasp. That's Peter Drucker. Some of you may have met Bryson previously, Edgar Schein, an organizational culture, also Peter Drucker as well. The Drucker Foundation, which you can easily find online if you searched it, has a mission self-assessment tool that you know, copyrighted in 2002, lists a mission statement for the American Red Cross as to serve the most vulnerable. Clear and concise, again, to serve the most vulnerable. Now, in 2010, if you looked online at the American Red Cross, you can look them up, their mission statement was the American Red Cross, a humanitarian organization led by volunteers and guided by its congressional charter and the fundamental principles of the International Red Cross movement will provide relief to victims of disaster and help people prevent, prepare for, and respond to emergencies. Rather convoluted. The 2012 version, if you went out and looked even right now at the American Red Cross website, says the American Red Cross prevents and alleviates human suffering in the face of emergencies by mobilizing the power of volunteers and the generosity of donors. Much clearer, not as concise as to serve the most vulnerable, but a very clear mandate mandate on who they are and what they do. Easy for all stakeholders to understand. Now, whether you want to talk about Enron, Tyco, or other for-profit ethics failures, or within the nonprofit sector, the scandals at the American Red Cross, the United Way, or even the embezzlements from churches and local government entities here in our region, the scriptural, my people die for a lack of vision, Proverbs, Isaiah, and Jeremiah, or my people die for lack of knowledge, which is Hosea from the Bible, it is a lack of clarity in mission, vision, and values that is at the heart of organizational problems. It's also so one of the reasons, if you pay attention to Daniel Pink, that he talks about moving away from shareholders or stockholders to stakeholders. 
from Gottlieb here, a lack of vision for what they were there to accomplish, a lack of values anchoring their work, and from that, a lack of understanding of how to incorporate the results, focus of vision, and values into the heart of everything they do, because vision and values are all about and results. Whether we're talking about public or non-profit or private organizations, determining who the most important and most influential stakeholders are is paramount in the early stages of organizational assessment. Remember that Bryson defines a stakeholder as any person, group, or organization that can place a claim on an organization's attention, resources, or output, or is affected by that output. The research is also clear, whether you're paying attention to shine or not, that when the entire organization is unified by mission, vision, and values that are clearly communicated and lived up to, that anything is possible. Often we find, though, that organizational leadership has a different meaning and practice for what mission, vision, and values say than what's actually practiced or understood on the front line of where the customer value zone exists. The key to success for public and nonprofit organizations and for communities is the satisfaction of key stakeholders. Clearly, that applies to for-profit organizations as well. And as Daniel Pink would say, start a department of why. Bryson talks about starting with a purpose, constructing a purpose network or a purpose expansion, and then choosing the purpose that best fits your new sense of purpose for the organization. Where are you going? Let that purpose be your guide and always keep asking yourself, what is our real purpose here? If there isn't a reason for us to be doing some exercise or some activity, then let's not do it. And occasionally, you're going to need to change your purpose, but when it's appropriate, not just some random whim. It is clear from considerable research that if organizations which are not useful, ethical, and clear about purpose, mission, vision, and values will lose customers and the best and brightest of our employees and the working capital we need to continue to survive as well. Purpose exploration should show you the connection between actions and outcomes, means and ends, and influences and results. We do get what we measure. If you haven't ever read uh, Edward Deming, a fascinating story, in part because his theories were rejected here in the United States, but helped rebuild Japan into an innovative and economic power. His work forms the basis of total quality management, out of which comes both Six Sigma and more recently Lean Six Sigma. You'll find some similarity to a lot of work since then, including Daniel Pink, Howard Gardner, and the work by the Gallup organization, among others. These symptoms will still heavily exist and led to the global financial crisis we've seen in recent years, as well as each of the various financial bubbles that have burst over the past 20 years. Organizational diseases include the lack of consistency of purpose, emphasis on short-term profits, evaluation by performance, merit rating, or annual review of performance, mobility of management, running a company on visible figures alone, excessive medical costs, and excessive costs of warranty fueled by lawyers. <laughs> we could have pulled all of this from our current headlines in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal. Deming was more about strategic management than strategic planning, but you can see from his PDCA model, plan, do, check, and act, however, that Deming's point should be taken to heart in both cases. With strategic planning and strategic management, you'd never reach an end finished plan because you're continually scanning the environments, measuring the tactics or activities to see if you're on target, and then adjusting accordingly. Michigan State happens to win this year's NCAA tournament. We already know that's not going to happen. That doesn't mean that the coaching staff or the university can say they've reached the top. Time to go home. No, they'll start after a vacation working on what comes next because we all know that change is the only constant in our life and in our organizations. But we can plan for that change and have some control in most cases over it. Obstacles from Deming to uh, organizational success and strategic management, strategic planning include neglecting long-range planning, relying on technology to solve problems, seeking examples to follow rather than developing solutions. Excuses that teams and individuals make are probably Problems are different from theirs. Obsolescence in school that management skill can be taught in classes. Reliance on quality control departments rather than on management, supervisors, managers of purchasing, and production workers to put the quality in place from the very beginning. Placing blame on workforces who are only responsible for 15% of mistakes where the system designed by management is responsible for 85% of unintended consequences. Relying on quality inspections rather than improving the product quality along the way. You might say product quality in a manufacturing sector, but it still applies to the service sector. Healthcare systems, restaurants, school systems, governments all offer a variety of products, and many at a substandard level, as you've probably experienced in your work. 
If you pay any attention to brain rules and presentation zen, which are in the doc sharing folder, both in our presentations and within our writing, the ability to show an image has a much greater impact on clarity and understanding than four or five pages of text. This example from Bryson, which isn't in your textbook, comes from purpose clarification for the Defense Language Institute in evaluating the purposes of their coursework. They wanted to produce a higher quality linguist. Higher level purposes also help act as visions, missions, or goals guiding our lower level actions. They guide knowledgeable exploration activities. They show us where changes in technologies and stakeholder environments might be needed. They serve as a basis for strategy formulation. They expand the search for options from which strategies and actions might be selected. And they keep people from jumping to solutions and fighting over the wrong things. They show us where loose coupling makes sense. Lower level purposes serve as a basis for strategic programming that guide the knowledge exploitation activities in fairly stable technological and stakeholder environments. They provide the focus for process management and improvement activities, total quality management, ISO 9000, Six Sigma, Lean Six Sigma, etc. And they show where tight coupling makes sense around key processes, show where people's attention should be focused most of the time. And Bryson's use of loosely coupled or tightly coupled systems relates to organizational design and is more more easily demonstrated in these two graphics. It's based on the work by University of Michigan Ross School of Business, Professor Carly Wick, and his work from 1995, Sense Making in Organizations by Sage Publishers, uh, and 2001, his book Making Sense in the Organization, which was published by Blackwell, and Managing the Unexpected, Assuring High Performance in an Age of Complexity with co-author Kathleen Sutcliffe. That's a Josie Bass publication. The top graphic comes from 2008, Loose Coupling as an Inhibitor of Internal Customer Knowledge Transfer, Findings from an empirical study in business-to-business -business professional services out of the Journal of Business and Industrial Marketing. You can see loosely coupled system having an emphasis on knowledge exploration and gains in individual knowledge, whereas in tightly coupled systems, the emphasis on knowledge is exploitation, and information is held by departments or by individuals for personal gain instead of being shared across the organization, but we do get some gains in collective knowledge. And the bottom graphic comes from packages and physical distribution implications for integration and standardization at the International Journal of Physical Distribution and Logistics Management, and you can see from the graphic that we have a product and packaging systems, and marketing, and environment environmental and how they all fit together. If you've not yet had organizational design in your classwork, don't have a heart attack. Either someone in your group has, or we will work together as you ask me to develop further materials for you. Your group project work does not include completely redesigning the processes or structure of an organization. If it did, we'd bring in the expertise to accomplish it. In organizational design, every one of you has practical experience in the impact of organizational design and management, so you do have some practical knowledge you can bring to bear. Your group Group work, again, does not include completely redesigning the processes or structure of an organization. But consider the organizational change that you've been through at current or previous employers or as a student of Siena Heights and even in organizations that you volunteer at. What was that experience like and did it work? Sometimes it does, oftentimes it does not. Just to wrap up, everything that the organization does, how it's designed, what processes we use, all have to fit within the guidelines of our mission. Often they don't, which again is why Daniel Pink suggests establishing a department of why. Bryson concludes this chapter with some examples of mission statements, and we've already looked at the changes that the American Red Cross made earlier. But it's time for you to take a breather and walk around the block or do some laundry before we take a look at environmental scanning. Regardless of the organization, planning a product or service that there isn't a need for is a sure way.